Oh, I think what uh, is easy to answer, and that was fossils. Um, I grew up in Leicestershire, uh, in Leicester, which is on the Jurassic, and uh, it's full of lovely fossils. Um, ammonites, belemnites, um, um, brachiopods, um, they're, they're very beautiful. And, and, uh, and how did they get there in the middle of the rocks, in the middle of England and so on? Uh, and I uh, had the collecting bug, which, and I, which I still have actually, which, which is the basis of so much natural history really, and, and so much of science. Um, and so collecting all these things and discovering what they were and how they lived and when they had lived and all that was um, abiding fascination to me uh, from the age of, I suppose, about eight. Um, and I still feel that way, actually. Um, I think one of the... Um, real thrills was, was sitting by a pond um, in, a, in a meadow in Leicestershire and looking down through the water and seeing a displaying uh, great crested newt. I'm not absolutely sure it was a great crested or just, just a crested, but it was, it was a displaying male newt and he had a scarlet belly. And, and I thought that was the most astonishing thing I'd seen. And coupled with, uh, I suppose at the same time, a dragonfly perched on a reed nearby, um, that was a revelation about the splendour and beauty and fascination and mystery of, of the natural world, which hit me uh, very hard. I mean, I, 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 I thought it was astounding. Well, I think almost any biologist would have to say it's Charles Darwin. I mean, that's a, a sort of a rather boring response, really, <laughs> because it is so predictable. Um, but he, he does tower over everybody else. Um, and, and the more uh, you read of... Um, uh, well, whenever you, you think about problems, now, now you think always it's worthwhile just seeing whether Darwin uh, contemplated that. And so often he did. And so often he was uh, so perceptive in his, in his response. And uh, I mean, we, I suppose one tends to think of him as the naturalist going around the, in the tropics and the Galapagos and all that sort of stuff. But of course, the fundamental stuff uh, was for him sitting in his garden in Kent. Um, and just looking at things and staring at them with that s deep, profound, inquisitive curiosity. Um, and he has to be the man, except that you'd be in such awe of him that you wouldn't be able to speak, really. I don't know what you would say about them. I mean, they have to have that that, in, uh, that curiosity themselves, otherwise they're not in the, in, in the business. And one has to think about why you say go into communication rather than actually doing it. Um, but that's actually what I did. I mean, uh, I, um, I, having taken a, a wartime degree, I had to go into the Navy and um, to do conscription. Um, and when I came out, um, I didn't have a doctorate. I just had a, a short wartime degree. And I knew I was uneducated. And I uh, thought about going back on grants, government grants, and entering that. But I, at that stage, I was in my early 20s. And I wanted to get married and one thing or another. And, and I thought I, would, I wasn't even sure that I had the, the dedication that a proper biologist really needs to concentrate on one particular um, uh, group of animals. So maybe what I'm describing is what a lot of other people feel, that maybe they don't feel that the research is their line, and therefore they would want to go into communication. I don't know, but that's why I did. Oh, I think it's never been more important ever in the history of the world um, that people should understand the nature of the natural world uh, and understand how dependent we are on it 
and realize that that if it goes if we injure it we injure ourselves that that, that we're dependent on the natural world for every particle of food we eat and, and for the air we breathe um, so understanding the natural world is is of paramount importance, particularly since now it's under greater threat than it's ever been in the history uh, of mankind. Well, to be truthful, I don't use it very much, uh, but I can see perfectly well how how marvelous it is uh, that you you. I mean, I you know I like books, and and I, I'm, I'm too old to change that that now. Um, but I can perfectly see that, uh, and, and when I'm working on a project and working with people who are helping and as researching, I mean, to see them going, oh, you've got a problem, even at the moment when you're actually filming, and when I say, what about, gosh, what about that happened? What, would that mean something? Before I knew where they are, there they're going, and they bring the answer. Um, and that is a fantastic thing. And it is, I mean, it, it must be changing the way in, uh, the nature of scholarship, really, uh, and the nature of research. Uh, the fact that you can immediately come out, communicate, not only with what everybody has known for 2,000 years, but everybody who's, who's working in the same field as you are. I mean, that is just extraordinary. Uh, <laughs> I, I think this is, a, this is a continuing neurosis. Neuro um, that's the word I want, a continuing <laughs> worry. I mean, as long as I can remember, scientists have been saying to one another, people don't understand us, you know. I mean, really, we, they don't understand how valuable they are, and uh, they don't understand that it's the basis of our, our civilization. We must project ourselves more. Um, and I suppose that's true, but I don't suppose, actually, that however much you do it, the, but the, the profession is going to say, oh, I think people know enough about it now and understand how valuable we are. I don't think they're going to say that. <laughs> but, um, I mean, we should keep on doing it. But I, I, I am not as, not as concerned and worried about it or, or, or think that it is a, a major problem in the way that many people do. So maybe I'm at fault. Um, well, I don't think it's all that difficult um, if you have a minimum space, but the trouble is that you, you have less space than we ever had. I mean, with the, the huge increase in uh, the size of the human population, the fact that, is it, that it has tripled in size since I started making natural history programs, I mean, it, it surely should make one think. Um, and uh, so that you are cut off and the, the United Nations says that over 50% of the Homo sapiens are now urbanized. So that means cutting off to some degree um, uh, from the natural world. And there's some people who never see a wild creature at all, um, unless it's a, a rat or a, or a pigeon. And they're not wild. Um, so uh, maintaining contact, you can do it if you wish to do it, and you can do it on a, in a window box. And, and, and television can help and should help. I mean, it is a responsibility to help. And, and giving new, now that, now that the problems we are faced are global, um, and, and even the most enlightened person sitting in a city is not going to be aware of what's going on in the world, larger world, unless he has access to television and unless television actually recognizes it and has that responsibility, which it should do. I haven't been in the Gobi, you see. I'm, I, I'm <laughs> in my dreams, I think Gobi has got dinosaur fossils eroding out every, t every time you turn around. Um, but there aren't many other things living in the Gobi. It is, after all, a desert. So I can't be expected to go and to pay me to go and make about the natural history of the Gobi because uh, it's few and far between. It's going to take a long time. Um, but I'm sorry that I don't know uh, the Gobi uh, on, and that sort of area. <laughs> well, I'm tempted to say a sloth uh, hanging upside down and nothing, needing, wanting nothing but another chew on a leaf. 
or I could, my imagination could could stray over over the, the, the strange sexual rituals of some species, which I won't specify, but one or the other. <laughs>could cite a number of things, I suppose, the first time I did this, that, or the other. But, but, but the, the one of the revelatory moments um, that was my good fortune to have had was the first time I dived on a coral reef. And, and the, the motion which so many people experience now of, of actually being late, uh, weightless is in itself uh, a revelation be able to move in three dimensions, just flip up or flip down. That is itself exciting, the moment you actually can do it with some degree of confidence. But to do it on a barret, on a reef, where there are a myriad invertebrates of fantastic colours and shapes and so on you've never dreamed of, you've never really seen on, on ever before. I mean, amazing. Mollusks, you know, shellless mollusks, those sea slugs, or uh, the corals, or uh, some of these robber crabs, or I mean, just, just amazing. Um, well, I know for one thing that it's no good just biologists doing it. Um, that the whole of Homo sapiens uh, has got to understand it. And the whole of Homo sapiens has got to change their ways. So um, biologists are, are leading the way, and biologists have got to make it apparent to everybody how important of what they are doing is. Um, I, of course, there are specialist conservation problems uh, which biologists alone can solve, and that's that's one thing which they are doing. Um, we need to understand uh, what um, ecological communities need and and how mobile they are, uh, and how. Um, it's not just a little plot here that you're going to understand. The whole of the world is in turmoil. I mean, uh, geologists in another uh, 2,000 years or whatever, no, much more than that, but people from another planet w would see that this is, we are in the middle of the Earth, it's in the middle of this huge biological, ecological turmoil. Um, and we have to understand it, uh, and you start by looking at the little bits, um, and then trying to piece them together in the picture, which requires the whole biological community to be talking to one another in order to, that people can get a, a comprehension of the turmoil in which our planet is involved in the moment, which is a biological turmoil above anything else.